Good afternoon, Josh. How are you doing? Hi, I break up. Okay. Yes, yeah, so um, welcome to the Great XR Podcast. Uh, we're happy to have you. Uh, before then, let me just do one introduction. So, Josh is, is a boss on his own level, right? Uh, but Josh has been really uh, supportive of most of the things that we've been doing in the XR uh, in the XR space in the past few months. And, uh, it's great to have you speak to our participants today, and uh, we believe that uh, as you get to talk to them, you would uh, be able to help them see how to navigate their way around the XR space, and also be able to show some of your works. And uh, we believe that it be a very, very powerful session. So. Uh, probably, maybe uh, when you're doing this session, there will also be like a key on a session where they can uh, get to ask uh, you know, for areas that they didn't really get clearly and see how they can also uh, how they can also uh, get that part there. Yeah, so that's basically so. Thank you for uh, accepting our offer to speak at uh, our XR bootcamp. Thank you very much, Josh. So, yeah, so yes, thank you. I'm glad to be here actually. Um, hello everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking here today. I, um, <laughs> I'm not the boss, like my mm-hmm. guest is. I'm just the regular one with like everybody else here. And uh, of course, just um, do my best to push the gospel of extended reality um, across Nigeria, Africa, and um, more at large. Um, I, I put together something small, but which is um, like a slide and all of that. But um, yeah, let me just see if I can quickly share my screen and we can um, get talking. One second. Um, do you see my screen? Yes, yes, you can. Yeah, uh, that's it. Um, all right, so um, before all of this, of course, I'll be wanting to speak about this video. This is um, what I actually uh, plan to talk about with everyone. And of course, I'm sure everyone has been enjoying uh, this stuff so far. Um, getting to learn a lot of stuff. I helped to work on Swift Dancer, um, we worked on Blender, we worked on um, a couple of other interesting tools <coughs> for XR prototyping. And um, of course, I'll be wanting to talk about actually prototyping XR experiences. Um, of course, I'll be um, attacking this more from the design perspective because, I mean, we are not going to go into anything programming and all of that. Um, we will look at uh, this purely from a design perspective, you know, how you can become an XR designer, things to consider uh, when you are um, prototyping an XR experience. And um, of course, I'm, I'm pretty sure we have done um, with uh, just to just start with the uh, conversation. Um, XR, we don't know XR is extended reality. And yeah, let's just um, get started with the uh, talk. So, a little bit about me. Um, since I'm not introduced my name is Joshua Ajayi, and um, I am firstly an AR developer. Um, I have a BSc in electrical electrics engineering. Um, of course, I am a game developer as well. I, I work as an instructor, um, teaching game development um, everywhere. I teach game development in Nigeria um, um, for a university in, in the US. Called Kobe Mujo. I also teach for um, teach at the university um, called Saudi Digital Academy. Um, also, I'm co-founder of a company called Empire XR, based in the US. And um, 
I have about seven years experience developing XR um, experiences, um, pushing out several products, XR related products, um, also working as an instructor um, in this field. So um, this is just um, a little bit about me, right? So I work with Saudi Digital Academy. I was um, I've been partnered with, with Saudi Arabian um, um, tech ecosystem for the past two years. Um, I have been supporting them uh, both physically and remotely, uh, trying to develop an ecosystem of game developers and also XR developers as well. Right. Um, so before actually, you know, doing all of this, I have also spent some time investing in the uh, Nigerian tech ecosystem. Um, also, as an AI developer, I have built a couple of products um, that are non-profit for um, for the Nigerian ecosystem. So yeah, you can see in the bottom right corner. This this was me about four or five years ago. Um, I started an initiative called Ogma, which is an augmented reality for education initiative where um, my main aim was to solve um, the pressing need for teaching and learning aids in schools, secondary schools, universities, and um, etc. Right. I'm going to dive in deep into some of these my projects um, and see how we can tie that down to um, prototyping in XR. Right. So, of course, um, on the top, top right corner, um, this is a, a snippet of my um, the, the projects we are building at FISR, that's my company. Um, it is basically, I'm going to be talking about it as well, but it is basically an, an augmented reality um, for safety in manufacturing. Right. So, what this is basically is an AR application that allows you to um, take refresher training, right? Um, and of course, the reason why we need to take refresher training is because um, there's a tendency to get complacent with um, machines and um, uh, you know industrial um, equipment over the years, and we tend to forget some of the safety um, practices that that is associated with um, dealing with those machines, right? So of course you're going to be um, the app app and solution is basically to help workers to learn about the common safety hazards and factoring um, both within the um, United States and um, all across the world. Um, in the bottom left corner, uh, this, that was me actually um, pitching my uh, any opportunity to pitch my um, product to. Um, the, the then Prince Charles of Wales, who is now um, the King of England, um, and King of the UK, actually. Uh, but then, of course, he visited Nigeria, and of course, I was one of the very few people that um, was able to speak to him um, physically and appreciate some of the interesting things that I've been working on uh, in augmented reality, virtual reality as well. So, of course, this is just um, by way of introduction. So, um, of course, getting down to business of the day, I'll be sharing, um, talking about the pandemic here, um, XR experiences, I'm going to be sharing two of the projects I just mentioned, um, which is um, Ogma Africa, which was the initiative I said I launched and in Nigeria um, for schools, and then I'll be talking about um, Empower XR and one of our products called Knockout Tagout. And which I explained that um, to be as an AI training app for safety and manufacturing. Um, my aim with this particular um, approach is to help us understand how to prototype XR experiences from the angle of um, products. So, of course, these are two projects that I, these are two projects that I worked, um, worked on myself, and of course, sharing my process. Right, so how did I how did I go about uh, prototyping this particular product? Right. So of course I'm taking us um, through the entire um, uh, project um, concept team to design and all that. 
So right here, um, am I, do you guys hear me? Just sorry, just want to be sure. I think you have a question. Do you guys still hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, cool. So um, the first project I'll be talking about, and then of course, like I said, I'm going to be breaking down um, uh, my process for designing this particular uh, product. And of course, this this is going to start as a template for you guys. You know, whenever you want to prototype. XR related products in the future, or now, or even at the end of this bootcamp, right? Um, of course, it will serve as a template for you, and um, you could basically use that across all of your um, XR designs, basically, right? So, um, the first pr pr project here is I call it the local tagout um, project. Of course, it's now named something else, but this is. Um, this was the first MVP I was designed, and I made this, you know, uh, for a couple of months. And of course, it's an AR solution for uh, practicing safety procedures in manufacturing. So, and as with all products, you have to um, you have to determine what the target demographic for that product is at the beginning of um, at the beginning of the project. So um, when we concepted this um, idea, we had to we had to in starting at that moment, you know, just determine who are who are we dealing for, what experience, um, what target demographic are going to need this experience, right? So and that's why um, we decided to take a short as in the manufacturing industry, right? And yeah. We said it's ideally for personnel who operates in sort of industrial grid machine. So of course now we know our target demographic. So always ask yourself as an XR prototype or a designer, um, who am I building for? Right? Who am I building for? So once you can answer those questions, um, you can now start jumping into um, the actual design process. Cool. So um, now that we've determined who we are uh, building for, who the product is for, um, we need to actually sit down and detail a couple of things, right? Before actually jumping. So like I'll just speak this now. The first step of actually making any sort of AR or VR products or XR products generally um, is to not jump on the design first, don't just Start designing a way, right? Don't just start um, writing code, maybe don't just start making anything, right? First step is understanding the problem and the need, right? So, in this case, our problem is the fact that um, we want to tackle complacence in the manufacturing process, right? So, of course, the second thing here is to create an experience design document to detail your XR. Experience what you want to do. So you have to sit down, even if it's a sketch or it's um, um, some sort of um, you know some sort of diagram, some sort of flow chart that can help you. Um, it is extremely important that you um, detail this particular experience. Um, do you guys still hear me? Yes. Just doing doing post check. Thank you. Just doing post check. So, um, second step is to create an experience design document. This can be anything simple. A flow chart could be um, just a sketch. Anything. You just do biro and paper. You just scribble something down, right? So, this is how I want the experience to start. This is, this is what I want to achieve with the experience, and this is what I want it to look like, right? So, before you actually jump on any sort of design, you need to create that document. It could be on a paper. I highly recommend you know, um, getting um, a hard copy you know, for yourself. Um, maybe a sketch pad and ideal part. Um, I mean, there are also tons of platforms that, that allow you to concept things down. Um, yeah. So you can just do that. 
press. And the third thing will not be, okay, let's now start prototyping, right? I understand a lot of us are new to this space. So um, it is very important to say this that the first step to prototyping or making any sort of designs in extended reality um, or AR or VR or, um, or anything related to that is to not jump on the prototyping stage first. Right? So the first thing to do is understand the problem, understand the need. So even if it's a it was a filter, you need to understand what you want to achieve with that filter, right? Um, what, um, why do people need this kind of filter? Because the aim for building filter system was for people to have fun, but then why are we making a filter um, with um, the goblin face, or why are we making a filter of, um, of Donald Trump? Why are we making a filter of Peter Obi? You know, why are we making a filter of whatever, right? You need to ask yourself a couple of questions, and then once you do that, and now start, um, Detailing your workflow right, before actually jumping into the prototyping stage. Now, um, okay, about the problem, and I said again, I'm going to be, I'm going to be referencing, I'm going to be referencing, um, I'm going to be referencing those pro projects that I mentioned earlier, right? So, cool. Um, the problem here for this particular project was that. Um, <clears throat> like I explained, workers can suffer from low memory retention and of course can lead to complacency um, because there are no refresher training. So, so you can see this worker here who just um, put his hands away in the machine and now he has something an injury just because he has actually forgotten, not because he doesn't know, but he has actually grown to use it. So there's this time we normally use um, Use um, in Nigeria here, and <clears throat> it's called Finish. You know, <laughs> Finish is a term that can um, can cost you your life in such an industry, in the manufacturing industry, right? So you can feel like you know how to use this machine. You have been using it for the past ten years, right? And because of that, you might actually um, become complicated to how you approach that machine, right? So that, that was a, that's a problem, and <clears throat> over 3,000 million injuries and about 9 fatalities happen every year. So imagine, even within these 3,000 injuries, you're having people that um, would have their, their um, arms cut, um, have some sort of extremely, um, extremely uh, bad situation where they're losing parts of their bodies because um, of complacency with machines and all of that. So that, that's a real problem, right? So we've identified a um, problem. Now, yeah, you go down to create your experience design um, document or maybe your concept. And again, this is just something that just came up with, like the sketch, right? When I, when I wanted to make that particular product, I just sketched something fast for it's going to be a very short experience, but um, this is how it's going to look like, right? So you don't necessarily have to um, have any sort of AR experience going on. You just drop images, these folders, and all that, and use that in the meantime. So you can see all these arrows. They actually help me to know. <coughs> excuse me. They actually help me to know how the experience is going to turn out, right? So um, create the home screen. I'm going to the um, first page of the experience where I'm building up the objects into my room. I can walk around the objects and then, of course, um, if I click on down here and going back to the home page, but from here I can also move to um, other parts of my experience. So, just I just don't want to go deep into this, but then this is how typically concepts um, and experience, right? <coughs> Yeah, so moving on. So, um, again, I'm going to introduce us to this, um, this structure that can, you know, help you um, become a world class prototype when it comes to AR or VR or XR generally, right? So, this, this concept actually um, has been proven, I've abused this like over a 
populous products, not just one product, over many products. And you see that this actually helps any sort of design, um, XR design um, products that needs to be prototyped, right? Um, cool. So for every XR design structure or every experience you want to make, you want to consider five things. And um, these five things are going to really inform how you are going to be um, creating that experience, right? So again, if it's AR or VR or whatever, this is this is going to seriously help you, right? So the first thing is your user environment, right? Again, this this can be anything. Um, of course, it's I don't believe it's as explicit as um, it sounds. The user environment could be um, your of course your immediate environment, trying to see if you can you know put your virtual objects in AR or VR. So if it's a VR, your user environment will typically be your virtual world, which is your maybe 3D environment inside VR. Um, but physically, if it's AR, it's going to be like your immediate environment that's via the camera. Right? If it's um, if it's a filter, your environment will most likely be whatever you're trying to track. It's a filter. For instance, if it's a face filter, your user environment here is going to be your face. If it's um, your hands, your user environment here is going to be your hand. It's going to track your hand, right? If it's um, if it's your table, the user environment here is going to be your table. So just think of user environment as that base, um, that base environment that it's going to interact with. That's where you want your experience to revolve around. Okay. So that's the first thing to consider, right? Um, the second thing would be the AR onboarding or the VR onboarding. Um, I purposely put AR onboarding here because it's, we are talking with, um, specifically about particular products um, that um, we're using as a use case, uh, case for the product. Um, you also want to consider interaction and feedback. So, one of the most important design principles for XR is interaction and feedback. So you want people to actually feel like they're doing something, right? One, I, I found that one of the most fun filters to use are filters that um, actually um, give some sort of feedback. So if it's a filter that, um, for instance, um, there's this particular way to think that online where um, once you track your face, um, it doesn't trigger until you smile. So when you smile, um, the Filter actually now triggers, and then you see like this very smiley, ugly face on um, your face, right? So that's an example. It's, it's interactive, which means it's detecting your face, trying to check for certain things like your smile, right? So also, interaction and feedback could also be in terms of sound as well, right? So maybe I'm touching this thing, I'm touching that thing, is it making pop sound? Is it making this sound? making that sound. Um, yeah, so if you're touching something and it's doing something, the interaction and feedback is probably going to be the most important part of um, any sort of XR design, right? So cool. You also want to consider the aesthetics. The aesthetics is how good does it look, right? I mean, people who use filters, and again, I'm going to be using filters a lot because I know we are all very much familiar with filters, um, and that's the most basic use case of XR currently, the most accepted use case of XR actually currently in Nigeria and everywhere in the world, right? <clears throat> you have someone who made a filter, and then um, someone's filter is hitting about 20 million, um, 20 million uh, engagements, like 20 million users engagements, and all of that. So. People come at apps like Snapchat, um, TikTok, Instagram, you know, they've actually helped to push that particular use case of um, XR um, to the general public, right? So, aesthetics is really important, and this is because people are drawn to what they see. Whatever um, design you're making as a prototyper has to look good, right? It has to look good, it has to feel good. So the aesthetics is really important. And the last thing, which is from a more technical stand, standpoint, is optimization. And of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about optimization. But then, um, since this is 
design class, I don't know the programming class, I do not really dive, dive too much into optimization as well. So, cool. So, again, I was talking about user environments. So, ask yourself a couple of questions when you are attacking a user environment uh, question. Okay, so what scale would be ideal for my experience? Is it going to be face tracking? Is it going to be um is it going to be my front camera and back camera? Right? And how much space would the user need for this to work, right? So of course I've, I've seen some filters that actually use back camera, right? And you can maybe for instance a filter actually allows you to simulate snowfall or rainfall, something like that. Right? That is this back camera and then you can make a recording and still really spot it um, in your room or outside, things like that. That's filter, right? So th that generally requires a lot more space than someone who's just trying to track their face. So the entire experience can happen on their face. Whereas someone who wants to make a brain, brain filter or who wants to you know, put a machine on the ground, in this case, as in this case, um, Needs a lot more space, right? So you need to ask yourself, what scale would be ideal for my experience? How much space does the user need, and will this be strictly in those experience? Um, so again, the reason why this particular point point is here is because um, over the years we've seen people actually um, say their XR is a bit unsafe because. Um, People get too immersed in the experience that they, they, are not, they are no longer conscious about their immediate environment. But then, um, that is why you need to ask all of these questions as a designer, right? As an XR like that. How much space would I need for this to happen, right? Would I need to, in VR, you typically have to set some sort of boundary around yourself. Just so that you don't step out of that, right? So all of your experiences is going to happen right on that spot where you are. Right. So ask, asking yourself all these questions will help you figure out the user environment and um, part of things. So yeah, I'm talking about um, interaction feedback. So again, there are different types of um, interaction feedback. I talked about sound, I talked about um, you know, being able to touch things and making things happen, right? Um, there, there are two types of interaction basically, and of course this is this has a lot of technical depth to it, but I'm just I'm just to try to simple. Um, we call it the screen space interaction and the wall space interaction, right? So for the screen space interaction, um, we probably typically have a 3D object right in front of you or um, the 3D objects you want to use and you probably have like a button that controls that experience. So you have typically buttons and things on the screen that actually control that particular experience. But wall space would allow you to manipulate that object itself, right? So in this case, um, this is a padlock, this is not a real padlock. This is um, a 3D object, it's a 3D bubble uh, that's being rendered in the reality, right? Now I can decide to repeat that bubble um, using my fingers, right? As though it's where right in front of me. And that sort of interaction is called wall space interaction, right? So wall space interaction is generally more interactive on the space, right? So of course you want to ask yourself. All of these questions, what visual cues would I be giving the user to aid responsiveness? Right? So these are really, really important questions to ask yourself. Audio feedback, screen space interaction, ask yourself what exactly do I want to leverage here to make my experience? Right? So moving on. Um, also, uh, there's something called the user onboarding. And again, as a designer or an XR prototype, it's extremely important that you help your users be comfortable with, um, with your experience. So let's just say you have really made an experience now, and I pick up that experience, there is a high probability that I don't know exactly what to do when I pick up my phone and um, 
one charity experience, right? Without onboarding. So the onboarding part of things is where you actually help the user understand how to use your experience. So it could be anything from the visual cue and um, from animation, right? So the visual cue could be like text that says, oh, scan your face um, to start this experience. Or it could be um, scan the ground, um, scan, scan the ground of the table or the flat surface to start this experience, right? That is some sort of visual cue that we're giving your users. Some sort of animation like this. Um, if you have played around with some AR applications, you're going to see like some little animations like this that just tells you that just shows you that you need to scan around, right? And that's that's how you onboard your users. It's extremely important because users will feel a lot more comfortable, you know, having to go through these um, little tutorials before um, using your your design or your XR design or your AR design, your VR design, right? So yeah, that you need to ask yourself uh, these questions. So how can we help? How can we help users understand their deep conditions for using the app, right? All right. So again, you have to consider aesthetics, and I know we've been learning a lot about three D modeling, um, getting things to look um, look cool, um, modeling our own objects. You know, you have to make things look really good, right? So again, for these particular products, we have to make photorealistic machines, right? Um, we are not using live machines, we need to use photorealistic machines. Machines that look like um, they are right in front of you, right? They have all the particular shininess of that, and because the machine also reacts to the lighting around it, right? So if I drop a machine, Visual machine on um, if I place on the table or on the floor, um, and there's some light source around it, it can actually use that as a light source, and it's going to look like it's actually there on your mobile phone. You can see the reflection of that light. So these are these are some technical things, but however, um, there are different um, there are different ways of achieving um, uh, aesthetic the aesthetic fidelity that you need for your um, experiences. So on your machines, you can decide to create extremely real realistic textures from your 3D software. It could be Blender, Maya, wherever you decide to make that. You could decide to um, use some sort of lighting effect from whatever software you're using. Um, again, I made all of this in software called Unity, so um, these, are, these are the things I had to do to make that machine both look realistic. So that's the part of aesthetics. So of course, there are simple things to note, and again, some of these, some of these things might be vague, but they are also extremely important. Um, always try to keep your experience as small as possible. Right? So as a prototype, um, you are not you are not concerned with actually making an experience that lasts for 30 minutes, one hour. Nobody wants to use such an experience, right? Um, try to keep your experience as small as possible. Um, so when it comes to actually designing or writing code, again, this is more for people who are into writing code and all that. Um, but not just for them, but for everyone. You need to always like stay courageous whenever you face challenges. And this is not just a life theory, this is something that, um, that is extremely required when it comes to designing and prototyping, right? So you're going to face challenges, you know, um, some design ideas will not have any sort of justification in your head, right? Sometimes you prototype and you finish your work and people will just tell you they don't like it, right? People will just give you the worst, the absolute worst creative ever. Right, so you need to be able to stay courageous, go back and make something again. That makes you a prototype by right? So a prototype by someone who who is who has the ability to make um, a small experience, right? But then is able to go back to remake that experience if there's any sort of changes that needs to be made to that experience. So um, yeah. Also, if you if you're writing code. Um, like I always do, or if you're not writing code, 
and maybe this does not belong to you, but for people that are writing for you, you always need to follow best practices and you need to make a code as clean and modular as possible. Right? So I'll be going to the next project, that was the first project, and of course we remember the takeaway from that is we remember the five branches of um, any design, five things to do to consider in any sort of uh, XR like, um, that you want to make, right? So always remember the aesthetics, the user onboarding, the interaction feedback, um, uh, and the other things that I mentioned as well. So let's go into it of Ogma and of you see how this actually helped me. And this same principle helps me to make this as well, right? So again, the problem here for Ogma was that there is a severe lack of teaching and learning things in uh, STEM subjects in schools, right? So um, of course I was once a student here in a Nigerian school. I schooled, I schooled my entire life in Nigeria and I know how difficult it is to actually um, have access to equipment in the laboratories. Um, I attended a public school, um, to be fair, and in that public school we had, um, we had little to no equipment in our laboratories. The laboratories we had, the equipment we had, we had just um, maybe like one or two different equipment, and you know, you have a public schools out in Nigeria, you could have like up to 50 70 students in one class, right? And imagine you want to take through certain subjects in class that are required practicals, right? So that was that was my story. Right? So again, the real problem is that there's a disconnect between theory and practical because students will not have. The opportunity to practicalize what they learn on the machine. So we are teaching them about um, how to do fractional distillation chemistry. They most likely would tell you the understanding class, but however, the course is supposed to take you through the practical as well. But because there's no there are no machines or there are no equipment for um, that would adequately show you what fractional distillation um, looks like. In real life, right? They would, this is going to cause a disconnect between theory and practical, right? So, my own very, very personal story is that um, I eventually was able to uh, uh, handle a pipette, which is a very small glass, um, very small glass of for those that are not science students. This is like a glass tube where you put in your chemicals to mix, right? And for some reason, I broke it in bed, right? and that is that was my origin point for getting it to um, AR, AR, right? I made a in the right? That was my motivation, right? I broke that a bit, and to be honest, it was <clears throat> it was the um, let me say, it was one of the things that really changed my life. Because, you know, I had a lot of friends from school telling me, you know, that I had to. Replace that bed, or I was going to face disciplinary action, blah blah, and all that. <laughs> right? And the reason why this happened was because I mean, that was the one of maybe five events that we had in the entire university, right? Um, in our chemistry <laughs> lab, um, that, was, that, you know, that was available for us at the time. So I broke one, and unfortunately, um, <laughs> yeah, I had to. I had to you know, face some sort of disciplinary committee. Uh, I mean, the problem was not even actually repaying the money for the pet. It was the fact that even with the money, they would not actually buy a new pet. But it was going to take them some time to order the equipment from abroad and ship it down to the school and all of that. Right? So that, that was my personal story. Okay, so again, like we looked at in the first experience, right? Um, the first thing to do as a prototype is to list and prioritize the problems, and then you want to focus on critical ones. This is especially important in um, in large scale um, pro um, projects. You know, you want to look at um, 
the project itself lists all the pro problems that you want to, you're trying to solve, and then you want to focus on critical ones, right? You want to use your storyboarding again, as in this case, um, students, and students and teachers want to use story, storyboarding to understand how users will interact with design, right? So I decided I was going to make an AR application that allows you to use your mobile phone to, uh, to carry out chemistry experiences, like chemistry lessons, right? So you are able to actually um, have an animated chemistry experience as though it was right in front of you, but you would not have an actual effect in front of you, right? So, yeah, that was what I wanted. So now I have to create a storyboard that would help me understand how this design was going to be interact, right? So the next thing was to prototype, right? Prototype. Again, I treat it on the fact that prototyping will always involve you uh, doing something and then doing it again and then doing it again, right? Until it is perfect. So that that was um that was the thought process that went into this, right? Of course, always identify your target demographic. So um yeah, the product was going to be for students and as well for teachers. Right. Then of course I wanted to create the experience for geography. So again, these are very good cool use cases of Augmented reality, right? So, um, in the geography um, aspects, I wanted to create experiences and feel in your life, volcanic eruptions. You know, nobody's going to take care actually about how to proceed to see um, the volcanic eruption, eruption, because I mean, we are in Africa here right now, and we don't have any sort of um, active volcanoes, right? <clears throat> yeah, certain other things that. Um, we, we might not actually have the opportunity to see with our two naked eyes right? things like the movement of planetary bodies and all of that. So I just felt this would be a very cool thing to recreate with augmented reality, um, virtual reality, right? So for biology, and I, I don't know if you saw the picture earlier, um, part of the human anatomy, anatomy like the human skeleton, um, the digestive system, things like that. Right, I could easily create an AR application that allows you to look into all of this, right, without having a physical um, human um, use for experiment. Also, for chemistry, things like titration, um, for mathematics, um, recreating simple algebraic experiences, right. Cool. So, yeah, back to our financial option, which was again. Um, which if, if there's one thing you don't take out of this um, talk today, um, if there's anything you don't take out of this, you need to take this out of this um, this talk today, right? So your design structure, you can, whenever you design anything, always consider your user environment, your onboarding, your interaction, aesthetics, and your optimization, right? Yeah. So um, again, the user environment. Um, what scale would be ideal for the experience? Table scale, what scale, etc. How much space does the user need? Right? Will this be a strictly indoors experience? Right? So yeah, you need to ask yourself this question. Um, also for the user onboarding, how can we help users understand um, the ideal conditions for using the app for starting? Right? So I want to use your app or your web experience or whatever you have done, um, you know, how can we help users, you know, use that? So if, if you are working on Swift Excel, you're going to notice that there's this animation right when you are about to scan your environment that tells you scan your scan the ground before you start, something like that, right? So it's extremely important to have user onboarding. Um, but also your um, visual um, your, your feedback interaction. How, what feedback would the um, users get? Right. So ask yourself all these questions. Um, how would that need responsiveness? Right. So moving on, also the aesthetics. How we want this to look photorealistic. We want it to look. Um, we want it to look like it's um, 
states, for instance, here, this is one of this is an example of planetary body. This is planet Earth, right? And you want to ensure that you're having extremely high textures that can um, adequately detail what you're trying to pass across, right? Um, yeah, so there are several things you can do to make your uh, 3D model look um, photorealistic, right? Or if not photorealistic, at least look realistic enough um, and look good, you know, pleasing to the eye, right? Cool. So, yeah, optimization. I know I didn't mention optimization in the first um, project, but then optimization um, is something extremely important for you. You might not have to bother about that now, but it's extremely important because you are already looking into Blender, trying to create your 3D models as well. It's important that you know when to reduce um, um, the quality of your models, right? When I say quality, not necessarily um, um, the visual quality. But then on the model itself, there are certain things that can make the model um, feel expensive. That's like this as the word I was looking for. Um, the world is the world is expensive, right? So there are models that actually are expensive for a mobile phone, right? So if, if I'm rendering an object that has um, six thousand plus triangles in from Blender versus an object that has just six triangles, right? I'll be having the experience laggy. So you notice that the experience is laggy on top of that, and it's handy to put, right? You want to check your uh, 3D model and ensure that it is um, optimized, right? And this is generally going to be from Blender, Maya, wherever you, you are modeling from, right? Ensure that uh, the models are as optimized as possible, right? So if you go online to search for 3D models, um, look for models that are low poly, low polygon, whatever. You see low poly models, high poly models. Ensure you are um, using between me to low poly models, right? Just so that you don't run into any sort of issues when you are prototyping. All right. So again, um, this is a more technical term. Um, but yeah, targeting a specific um, FPS value, FPS is pretty per second, right? So um, if you are a gamer or someone that plays games, you understand what FPS is. But again, this is how smooth the experience is going to run on the screen. Um, it, a lot of things can determine how fast your, um, your experience is going to be or how smooth it's going to be, right? So ensure that you are optimizing your 3D models and everything as much as possible. So cool. Um, yeah, so there are also results that come out from a prototype. And again, this is just a case study. Um, my first prototype, and again, I was telling you that prototyping actually means um, that you you run from you are running from um, the first um, the first attempt. You are going back to do several attempts, right? So it is it's just a case study. Um, depends on whatever software you're using, but in this case, the first prototype I made was a huge mess, right? Um, I installed it and it was about 400 megabytes plus for that small experience, right? Um, it did not install on many devices, the tracking was unstable, and there was, there was a lot of flickering on the models um, due to uh, low APS, right? So on the second prototype, I decided to Split the experiences because I realized that having biology, chemistry, um, uh, physics, ge um, geography, and maths, maths um, all of that experience put into one application was too much. So I decided to split all of them into four different apps, right? And I, I reduced the build size and all of that, right? So my release version was um, extremely um, optimized. I had to do a lot of um, uh, neat tricks, AR related tricks, to make it work. But again, the reason why I'm saying this is because um, why I'm emphasizing on prototyping is that AR, VR is developing, right? There are a lot of tools out there that can help you to make any sort of AR experience. Um, uh, yes, you know, of course, I'll be expecting questions as we regard some of these tools, but then 
I know we have talked about some of them. Spark AR is a um, lens to you. Yeah. So many of these um, other apps, right? There's Unity, there's um, Institute, um, SDKs, like Euphoria, um, plugins like AR Foundation, and all that. Um, XR Interaction Toolkits, um, Mixed Reality Toolkits, things like that that actually help, help you, will help you to make your experience, your XR experiences, right? Go to AR and VR as well. So, cool. Prototyping will always be. Um, um, Prototyping will always be a core, um, uh, a core part of um, you know, XR experiences. So, XR experiences are never perfect on the first try, right? And um, yeah, the more you keep prototyping, the better your experience is going to be, right? So, these are some tips for prototyping. It is always better to start simple but well designed experiences. Again, this is um, using AR as a use case. It's always, it's always better to start with simple but well-designed AR experiences rather than multiple contexts but loosely designed experiences. So what I mean here is that it is better that you um, it's better that you start with smaller experiences, right? Ensure that your experiences are as small as possible. Minimize them to uh, maybe just um, about two or three minutes of the entire experience in total. So but once you are having an experience, once you are looking at your experience document or your wireframe or whatever, and it's spanning five minutes, ten minutes and beyond, and you want to start breaking, um, you want to start thinking of breaking those experiences into smaller chunks, right? Just so that you can be able to optimize your body and have um, a well-rounded experience, development experience, right? So um, also. This is extremely important as well. It is better to factor in the target deployment devices from the very start of the project. So um, things like SwiftXR and um, of course will not will not uh, give you any sort of problems because you can deploy that to the Android or iOS device as some well. way. But then you will come to other AR experiences um, that are not web-based and you know you have to start thinking, am I doing for iOS or Android here? Because iOS has capacity to run this much smoother than Android, right? So I need to optimize things better for Android than for iOS, right? Uh, so cool, you need to actually have factor that in from the very start of the project. Because that's, that's going to determine your choices, choices that you make, the design choices that you make for your prototype. Also, the third thing, um, which is final tip, is never underestimate the power of visual cues and animation when you are crafting out your experiences, right? So the core, I would just like to say that the core backbone for interaction or interactive experiences is, um, like I said, feedback. Feedback, right? So feedback is absolutely important. Visual cues, audio cues, um, animations, tutorials, uh, is a surefire way of helping people to get comfortable with whatever experience you are made, right? So, yeah, these are just quick tips that you can just keep in the back of your mind, right? So, um, yeah, that would be all uh, yeah, I have to say. So, again, like I said, if you don't take anything from this talk, um, refer back to that particular diagram where I listed five. Um, four branches that um, would actually you are, you need to ask yourself questions before you make any sort of prototype. Ask yourself those questions, and once you ask yourself those questions, you find out that you're typing world class um, experiences in no time, actually. Right? So, yeah, I, I, I hope this has been informative and I will be taking questions now. Thank you. Right, right. Thank you very much, Josh. I believe this was really informative, right? Uh, even for me, I'm not feeling really yet. <laughs> right? Uh, I think if there's one thing that I really appreciate about everything you said is understanding the structure of how to go about building the metaverse, right? Building either AR stuff or VR stuff, and, which is really key 
beyond seeing the exciting stuff on, on the internet, it's, it's very important to understand how, how do you get there, right? And I think that's something you really um, pounced on, you really, you, you killed it. <laughs> right, so I, I, does anyone have any question? Please ask if you have. Can you hear me, Josh? Yes, I, I can't talk. So do you get that question? Questions, questions, questions. Okay, um, what was your first experience? Like, you can, first? can you hear me?
um, you can actually the timeline to each of these things. For the first one, um, I mean everything within um, uh, roughly three weeks to one month because they were like all different experiences. And uh, again, I I had to start screen for 3D models and all that. And I was working with them. Uh, so yeah, roughly three weeks to one month. And eventually when I was done, um, by the time I polished the entire experience, it was about, about two months in total, right? And I had it shipped to the Google Play Store and the Apple Store as well, right? So uh, two months for that first project. The second project took um, much lesser time. Um, that was about two weeks. So prototyping generally does not really um, mean that it has to be be very big. It has to be, it be small, but then you could finish that small thing within three, four, five days, and then over the uh, over the next three weeks, you are just taking that thing and then making it better and better and better. Do you understand? So start start maybe it, you finish it in like three, four, five weeks, but then in the next one week, two weeks, and now start making that thing that you're going to look better and better. Right? That's why that's what people like generally do those here. Thank you. Any other question? Okay. No questions. Do you have any questions? 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 Interesting. Uh, so yeah, right. Um, I want to say a very, very big thank you. Grace of want to say a very, very big thank you for this uh, session you had with us and uh, the participant. And we are really grateful for your time, for your effort. We are grateful for the commitment that you have showed in the past few months. And you know, I want to say a big thank you. Just all my neighbor when I was in school, so he was like, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, one of the things we look forward to doing is, um, you know, having more engagement. And I think from the last one, I was trying to add the job. It might be here, I'm putting him on the spot. <laughs> it might be in Cardinal, maybe by the end of this month or the uh, beginning of next month. Uh, so, yeah, right, we're looking forward to having him around. You know, we we'll definitely call you guys to come around and you know, have a chat with him. And, Yes, so maybe when you guys do have one question now, you might have questions then. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can also uh, follow or connect with Joshua on his LinkedIn. I think if you go to his website, if he, uh, go to his website you, you see a link to his, all of his uh, uh, social media platforms and professional platforms there too. I mean, I believe it's there, Josh, right? Um, yes, I don't know if that is yes, but um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Okay, okay. So if, if you can't find, for, especially for the LinkedIn, you could just search for Joshua Guy. You see one fresh guy like that. Has. <laughs> so, so, yeah, thank you very much, Josh. I'm really grateful. Yeah. I was just going to say one thing. All right. I was just going to say one thing. Um, so, guys, um, I understand this is going to be a hackathon at the end of this week, um, and that is, um, it is a fantastic opportunity to. You know, use the skills you have learned from the hackathon to make something. And to be honest, um, a lot of the first um, experiences I made were from hackathons and you know game kind of things like that, right? So you want to take it serious. That's what I'd say. Take it serious. Um, make something. Um, uh, maybe not. You might not be able to make something extremely um, you know world class yet, but then. Don't don't take it for granted, right? Um, yeah, just make sure you are make sure you are putting your best into that particular hackathon. Um, of course, I'll be very interested to see what everyone makes at the end, right? And um, yeah, there are exciting opportunities in this industry, right? It's not just I'm not just going to be producing things and be sharing it with people, right? There is a lot of um, opportunities that exist in this industry and. Let me just tell you the fact that whatever you make in that platform would be your likely be your first portfolio piece um, when it comes to AX, right? You you 
be able to put it into your portfolio and show people, even with the education employers, that this is a symbol I made from an offer at that point, right? Yeah, so just take, take use of that option and make something with it, right? Yes. Sorry. Okay, you have a question now. Yes. <laughs> okay, someone have a question. All right. Yeah. Your case is that of a, a train that's about to move. <laughs> so, uh, all the time. And my question is, um, in case I create a field that is a two million people using. Yeah. Is there any financial benefit for that? I'm just curious. There are platforms that actually would allow you to monetize um, views. Um, yes, but however, I, I, I'm not exactly sure because I'm not really specialized in the data industry. Um, but I think the yeah, TikTok and some other platforms actually let you monetize once your views become a certain number, right? So once you hit like say 10,000 or 20,000, they probably might reach out to you um, with a badge, sort of badge, they pull you like a uh, creator or something like that. They give you a creator badge, and once you have a creator badge, you can start actually start any from that, right? So creators um, are people that people that have any like. 20,000, 10,000, 20,000 um, views on their filters, right? And trust me, filters blow really fast. People are using filters every day. So, yeah, I believe companies like TikTok and Snapchat actually have um, a financial motive for their creators. So, their yeah. creators are people that are, that are you know, racked up so many views on their effects, effects for their. Uh, I think I think one idea popped up in my head this morning. I was like, can you if you if, you, if, if I made a filter like uh, you know we are trying to promote African based creation, right? And content. So imagine I create I create a filter that um, helps ladies to see you know this shuku yeah. all back at these like all these shuku those ones like yeah. Yeah. imagine exactly. Yeah. exactly if you remember there was one time there was this filter that makes you look bad. And then a lot of people use it, right? So imagine having that shuku, and a lady wants to try out that air, she doesn't know if to fit that. Yeah. She can try that out, and definitely that would, don't steal my idea anyways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that kind of idea would definitely blow up. Promoting African based content, right? Help Africans, you, you'd be able to see, you have a lot of Africans try out these things, right? Look at guys in the US or guys in outside, outside of this country. Right. Most of them are now doing it, right? Yeah. We are promoting our African-based content. African-based content, African fashion, African everything, right? So it just makes sense, right? See the use case, and I believe uh, one thing that Joshua has tried to do is help you just break down all of the steps. Now, if you follow those steps properly, you'll be able to define the problem you're trying to solve right now. Uh, those two might get yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right, all right. So no question again. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Uh, yeah, go on. Really, 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 really great. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah. Enjoy the uh, bootcamp, guys. Can we also say thank you, Josh? Thank, thank you, Josh. All right, thank you. <laughs>